Hey, how's it going? I'll just go up to <laughs> questions. Um. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good. Good. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It sounded like your signal was breaking up a little bit, but alright. Yeah, no, it's going good now. There's, um... For some reason, the page that has the questions, every time I scroll down, it scrolls back up to the top. So I've gone through like a bit of a time. Oh, weird. Loop. I do have the questions pulled. Yeah, I do have the questions pulled up on mine. Oh, cool. I've got it. Yeah, all right. So I'll ask the first question. Um, does magic have an opposite? Okay. And if so, what is it? I suppose that would tie into the uh, concept of, you know, sacred versus profane, which really is more more or less um, purely universal. Uh, so I would say the mundane and the ordinary and the everyday, but at the same time, anything can be imbued with magic or magical meaning. Right. Okay, so because if... Are you taking magic as, like, the um, the art of changing consciousness? More or less. I mean, I think there's a lot that we don't know about what's going on here or, yeah. you know, what's up with it. But I would say that, yeah, Cause then, that's a good way to put it. Because then and, if, if you're alternating that with the profane, <laughs> then sa like having a, saying a swear word would probably cause a resistance in cons consciousness rather than a change. Oh, no, no, not pretty profanity in that sense. The profane isn't like... I mean, it includes stuff that's, like, bad or taboo, but it's not just that. It's just, like, the opposite of something that's, like, sacred. I'm kind of using, like, Levi Strauss's definition, which is oh, okay. kind of the main one in anthropology. Oh, cool. All right. So, um, how do you define open-mindedness? Um, that would be the ability to admit that or to, to accept that you may have been wrong about something when you're exposed to new information you didn't have before but yeah. without it being perceived as wounding the ego because a lot of times people do get actually attached to their beliefs and also you know attached to a sense of like being right and sometimes you know yeah. it can be an ego wound to really because you're wrong but you have to be able to accept that i'd say it's also like being able to take a step back from yourself and kind of take someone else's perspective would be part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, having those doors opened in your mind is part of the open mindedness. Like it's the, that's the, like it's the, it's the doorway itself. Yeah. Um, and you have to accept that you're just, you're just a person. You have limitations. You don't know everything. And, you know, you have to stay open to um, new information when it comes. Yeah, it's just that um, it seems like some people don't like to argue their point. So they, they won't um, express the alternative information that they have that was, is probably keeping them from changing their mind. So because there, there is sometimes, uh, there has been times where somebody has thought that I've been wrong, but I've um managed to like reason for it yeah yeah and people also have different baseline levels of cognitive flexibility hanging into it but so i guess yeah, open-mindedness open mindedness would be different in different territories to integrate <clears throat> like different so belief systems would have different sorry. types of open-mindedness Yeah, and like, you know, different ideologies may uh, in encourage or discourage 
open-mindedness, depending. Yeah. Um, so, what are some examples of the kind of open-mindedness that you were talking about? Where somebody um, has been... Something like, you know, maybe you don't like trans people and you think it's just a lifestyle, but it's like an icky one to you and, you know, you don't think it should be a thing. And then you come across information about, like, uh, how gender works in the brain, about the fact that even biological sex isn't binary. It's like learn more about trans experiences and have your mind change. Yeah. Because I have known people that went through that process. They used to be transphobic, but more education and information changed their mind. Yeah, well, in some body types, it seems very strange. But, um... Yeah, and, and that's... You know, if requires it's, open-mindedness. If it's done in a way that's made that. to be attractive, like it's, um, it can be appealing to either sex. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what Sorry, do Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I'm still connected. Yeah, you're still here. What do you oh, know about open, about mindfulness? Okay, cool. Have you heard of mindfulness? Look, it's hard to pin down, but it's certainly something that I practice. I would say it's the practice of remaining self-aware of yourself and your own mind. Like, what you're feeling right now. Yeah. Like, what you're thinking. Like, why you might feel the way you feel. Like, emotional and cognitive insight, basically. Yeah. And the process of cultivating that. So, doing things with some kind of, like, a preset intention. No, not even so much that, honestly. What? It's it's more like understanding yourself. Like maybe you feel a certain way and, you know, you, mindfulness helps you examine what am I feeling right now? Why do I feel this way? What are the factors that are playing into this? And like work through those things. It's, it's a self-reflection kind of a deal with, with interiority. Yeah. But it is also good to but, be mindful of, you know, what you're doing. And, and but, part of it is having a purpose to what you're doing. But you, you have to maintain you know, that. We don't have that much time. You have to maintain that consistently in the purpose. present moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like you can't let go of that. Yeah, exactly. Because all that we have and know for sure that we have is the present moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what is consciousness to you? That's a great question. That's kind of my thing, is like consciousness. What is it? Why is it? Why is it a thing? I kind of ran into the vertiginous question at the age of eight, so caused some dissociation there. But to me, I guess how I conceptualize consciousness and like how I define that term, it's more like the fact of awareness. It's not like the mind. The mind is something that consciousness is in or perceives. Like you have a consciousness, but like, you know, even like a flatworm, the basic brain that has like perceptions of the world can also have yeah. consciousness because its umwelt is going to be different from ours. And so it's to me it's more like the fact of like awareness and beingness and being hereness it's itself um and then like i said it's other things that like inner experience you know is something that consciousness is in or experiences and so is outer experience yeah Consci and, what consciousness is in is very you know interesting I, I, point. yeah like it's um because yeah. and the experience is same like if the experience is accurate then it's contained within part of the experience itself because it's it's yeah, like, like the whole thing is what is that which experiences but things that we don't really think of experience or perception feelings and thought also something that perceived. so it's something that naturally sees more than itself Yeah, and it's paradox it can be paradoxically self-reflected when it reflected when it's embedded in a system uh, with the complexity and nature of a human brain, where you start getting self-awareness. Yeah, and like the uh, um. And so it reflects back on it. You can sort of draw some. But I do think it's almost certain that. Yeah. And have a sense of like structure. Yeah, and I, I think it's almost. 
and the the sense of the being here-ness is what consciousness is to me. Yeah. And I do think it's quite likely that that goes back pretty deep evolutionarily, um, and, but it does seem to be contingent on um, having a brain or a neural system, and I think that has to do with complexity of signaling. And something about that immense complexity maybe brings in consciousness or creates it. I couldn't tell you which. Crazy. Brings it in or creates it. Right. Okay. That's an interesting um, disparity that you can't distinguish between. Well, nobody knows, you know, it's there's yeah. different, different conjectures, like, is an individual consciousness just, you know, it's born with the brain and it dies with the brain? Is there some kind of higher consciousness you merge back into? Is there some kind of persistence of it outside of physical life? And that's what I'm referring to there is, yeah. we don't know yeah. whether it's something that exists, can exist outside of ourselves or not. So these are very good or questions. Of I'll have to... Physical- I'll have to try and give my own answers to the questions and go back through and answer your questions too. But that'll take a lot of time. Um, all right. Because for me, okay. these these are these are kind of open-ended questions that don't really have, like that they're, they're yeah. more choices of how yeah. you, how you choose to define the world. Don't have a definite answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what are your favorite magical texts, and what is the key to their magic in a nutshell? That's a good question. Um, I the first one I really like used and discovered was the Greater Key of Solomon. Um, I would say the key to their magic is, and, and um, I also I use a lot of like ancient stuff, like Homeric hymns and um, Vedic hymns in like ritual practices as well and that's probably kind of idiosyncratic to me but i use those a lot as well and i think what the key is it is meaning and the construction of meaning and what it means and that you're imbuing it with this that's not to say magic doesn't physically exist because who knows but it all comes down i think to like symbolic thought which is particular to humans and and to meaning and the way that we construct meaning right so this is the lesser key of solomon you know these texts i didn't realize the lesser key of solomon was about that so come again was that the lesser key I'm sorry, I can't catch what you're saying. Was that was that the lesser key that you were saying, the book? Oh no, no, the greater key actually oh, cool. was the one. And I still to this day I have I think it's the fourth pentacle of Venus that I'm wearing a pendant of right now. Oh, uh the cool. Venus ones were always important to me on yeah. a personal level. But yeah, I never really really read the lesser key or had much interest in like Western demonology. Yeah. So I'm not as familiar with that one. Yeah. Um, so because because God has many f- names and many faces, um, many appearances, many shapes yeah. and many forms, every angel every is a messenger of, of one of those shapes and forms. So they all take on different roles. Yeah. And the angels that came to Absolutely. Earth... Absolutely. The angels that came to Earth came to destroy Earth and build it anew. Because we were made of dirt, which was corruption, so we f- we feed off ourselves. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Then um, the cultural framework we're talking about. Um, yeah. So that yeah, those the ones that came to Earth are demons. So you have to be able to like control uh, those, gotcha. to control those strange demons of mind and nature, because like authority is is one of those demons, is what well one of the creations of those demons. Yeah, like oh. So it's an emanation of it. And there's a very similar concept in the Dharmic in the Dharmic religions of the wrathful deities. Like they're that way for a reason and they have a purpose. It's not like a good evil thing. Yeah. They're associated with certain things. 
Yeah, and you have to delve in to delve into your shadow. You have to kind of do the demon work. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and you know, I think like for a lot of people, like that practice can be very powerful in like overcoming some personal things, and like you said, confronting the shadow in the Jungian sense. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Do you have another favorite text? Um, yes, I, I read voraciously, so I read a lot. Yeah. Uh, some of the most important ones to me as far as my, my philosophy or my outlook or ideas were, um, let's see, the Bhagavad Gita and by extension, yeah. you know, just like Hindu texts in general, I vote, and um, Ernest Becker's The Denial of Death had a profound impact on me. It's how I discovered social constructivism, and also I think my ex put it well. He solved the problem of enlightenment, and nobody noticed. Um, but those are ones that are really important to me. Also, the works of James Hillman, the works so of who Carl solved Brandy, the problem of um, the... obviously the work of you. Which, which book solved so the problem of enlightenment? Lot, but... Which so book solved the problem of enlightenment? Oh, um, yeah, I feel that the book The Denial of Death did, it, or Ms. Becker's kind of masterwork um. about, like, human finitude and the way that we deal with finitude and limitation, That's and okay. it's, you know, I couldn't, like, encapsulate everything verbally in some he sentences, builds, but I definitely recommend uh, it to, like, Builds on Kierkegaard, Freud, Brown, and Rank. Yeah, he builds a lot on in his work. Is there... It's on Amazon. I might be able to find a PDF of it. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, the denial of death, there it is. 97. Yeah, yeah. I end up, like, recommending it to because it's, it's, it's really a good and very poignant read. Cool. Yeah, this is, um... A every reader asks the same question. Like, what's your favourite text? But then they kind of, like, narrow it down onto, like, what they want, kind of... Um, but everyone can ask it. I might save it into my music folder. Yeah. Okay. And I get the Greater Care Solomon. Cool. Mm. Uh, do you have any other favorite texts just in general? Um. Like I said, uh, pretty much the collective works of James Hillman. Um, the Dream in the Underworld is one of the most important. I can't believe I left that one out. That uh, one is extremely like important in the way and conceptualized it. The Dream in the Underworld. And the rest yeah. of his work too. Also, Carl Perendi, who writes about like the intersection of depth psychology and Greek mythology, and then Campbell kind of does something similar. But yeah, the um, dream in the underworld is a big one, and that also ties a little more into like magic than um, some of the other ones do. Not all, but um. so the only one I can find is Patrick Radden Keefe talking about the under the Chinatown underworld and the American dream. But, um, so I have a copy. I can probably just like upload it. Hang on. I gotta find it, but I actually, I have a digital copy that I just Is it kinda, like, fiction? In, so. It could be fiction. Um, no, it's not, but it's about, like, the psychology of, like, dreams and, and underworlds. Like, you'll notice my, my username is an epithet of Persephone. I'm very uh, underworld-oriented. Yeah. And this book, like, uh, really is one of the most important for me I've ever read. Yeah, like, uh, I feel like I just swim in those circles for some reason. Mm. 
yeah but yeah very underworld oriented and that's kind of my thing as far as like the esoteric or occult oh cool you got it right there that was quick yeah yeah i just had it in my belly. cool those are um uh, they're very poignant topics to talk about after what we've discussed. Yeah. Uh, what's the moral to their stories? So um, I could ask that about any uh, individual well, one, but um, I think it will just stick with the favorite text. So just that that um, the dream in the underworld. Okay. What's the moral to the story of the dream um. in the underworld? what it's actually like about is it's a work of like analysis of the intersection of myth with depth psychology which was depth psychology was pioneered by um carl jung and you've also got like uh, hillman is a post jungian is what i'm trying to say oh, okay. and what it's about is it's about the unconscious and how uh it manifests in dreams and in conceptions of an underworld in cultures. And it's about dream work. Yeah. And about the dream and the unconscious and the things that come out of that and what they mean. Yeah. And uh, learning how to navigate through it. And it has a, a final Without being um, privy to all of it. It has some things about yeah, but I'm, I'm a person of dreams and of the underworld. That's really, the unconscious is really my, like, area of focus and where it affects with consciousness. Yeah. And, cool. you know, the unconscious and all of that stuff that lives in the mind and the brain, I see that as being the underworld. Yeah, there's a lot of... Um... like potential for um, something to hold on to in the mind. It's not even that it's something to hold on to, it's that things lurk down there that you haven't become conscious of and they, they affect you, they drive behavior even. And so to shine light in the uh, in that underworld is to better understand yourself, and then you end up better understanding yourself, your motivations, your emotional processes, and and you can live more mindfully if you have a handle on that. Because like I said, these unconscious things do affect how you think; they affect behavior. You know, yeah, like cognitive, emotional, and behavioral uh, consequences. Yeah. So I wanted to navigate um, the Library of Babel to the real world um, just by making all the okay. symbols sh as, as just inferred to be shorthand. So like putting the meaning there and attaching it to like real stories. Have oh, you, that's cool. Have you seen yeah, the Library of sense. Babel? So it was, it's just like gibberish. So it's just like... No, I actually... I have, I've been on the library of battles for three years, but I had never actually like really looked or been active there. And I was like, I was looking for an occult server because um, after my ex and I broke up, we, I wasn't in his servers and he wasn't in mine. So I was looking for other ones and I noticed I followed that one. So I figured I'd check it out. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not super familiar with the library of Babel and its project and all of that. No, um... I mean the actual like because it it's just it's a bit kind of about the book, um and the book is just oh, like okay. it just contains it's just the idea of like having an infinite library of every possibility, but the library has oh, like a particular. Well, I know what you're talking about. It was a Jorge Luis Borges story. Now, yeah. yeah, I've read that actually. I know what you're talking. About. Yeah, and it's like um, yeah, yeah there's like a particular structure to it and you've got to try and navigate through it. Yeah. 
and that's very underworldy, ridiculous structure to navigate through. Because it doesn't work on the the same brain processes as waking consciousness does. So you're dealing with like a whole other animal there. Yeah. Yeah. But if you focus on the unconscious too much, then you'll always be looking like behind your back. Not so much behind your back, but then again, I, my relationship to it is different and healthier, frankly, than most people's. But it's true that like being like too interior with it, you know, you can lose sight of like what you're doing externally. That probably is a risk with that. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I was thinking about with Freud because he was like forcing medical treatment on people and they, um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, like it was like they kind of didn't really need it and part. they didn't really want yeah, it. Yeah, he had a couple of things. It was just like he had power so he just did Yeah, it. yeah. Mm, exactly. Like I, I, I yeah, majorly agree with that. Uh, so Freud actually, is mostly Shit. It's actually a practice Wait. of putting humans under yeah, le- control of other humans on purpose. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, you know, I have a, I take issue with the psychiatric industrial complex for that kind of reason and how it plays into, like, coercive power hierarchies and structures of power. Yeah. And you can see um, when you go into their cupboards, which, like, companies they sponsor... Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes they're like incentivized to prescribe medication. Yeah. And also, I feel like people don't, like when people have like a mood disorder, for instance, they just get meds thrown at them, which can help stabilize someone, but they don't really get actual help working through the underlying psychosocial aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, um, People, a lot of people prefer nature. As yeah. It, as it is. Like yeah. regardless, like there is regardless nothing of wrong medical with, like, influence as taking well. A medic- yeah, yeah, exactly. Some people do like have reservations about that. Now, I think there's nothing wrong with being on a medication. Like I take, I'm, I've been taking bupropion off label to help my executive dysfunction. Yeah. So there's there's nothing wrong with taking yeah. patients, but it's the person's choice. And yeah. I feel that SSRIs, you know, they're not super well understood how they work, but they basically it has to do with frontal lobe connectivity, and I feel like that process isn't going to happen unless you're like working out and talking through the like I said psychosocial aspects. And it's getting better, like within psychiatry, but they really fell into this over medicalization for a while in the few decades prior to this one so yeah. kind of cleaning up the mess from that yeah because it's something like 40 percent of people now <laughs> oh yeah uh the cdc statistics i saw were now keep in mind this is like just for mood disorders but it's like estimated at 20 to 25 percent of people have like have or have had in the past a clinically diagnosable like mood disorder it's like at that point, surely you would legalize like all the recreational ones too, and just let people have like more uh, self-control, self-direction over like how they want to behave. Yeah, and it's, and it's or toward having something like depression or anxiety. But oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, my computer. So I didn't lose my connection because I went out to have a smoke. But um, God, what was I on about? Oh, um, like when it when it you're always gonna have people that are genetically predisposed. But when it's twenty to twenty five percent of people, you gotta look at socio cultural factors. This is a system. Yeah. Like who's blaming who and what for? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like the ways in which the society and culture in which we're embedded leads yeah. to despair. Uh, things like capitalist alienation and yeah, all, all, all of these things, you know, come together, and what you end up with is people, you know, people living with immense despair. Yeah, and which manifests as a you know clinical mood disorder. Yeah, because it's feels like um i guess you're left to your own devices and it's hard to rely on yeah we also yeah we lose our sense people don't always have a sense of support and community um and it our our lifestyles can be very isolating also people end up with like a lot of social anxiety which exacerbates those issues yeah That's why I like the idea of having a community of communities. Yeah. Your community building is like very, very important for, for humans to do. Like humans are supposed to do this. It's what humans are made to do pretty much. Yeah. Um, so does life have a purpose? And if so, what is it? Um, other than, you know, stuff it really does intrinsically to me that's something you can create for yourself rather than something necessarily predestined at the same time i have suspicions that something else might be going on with like some form of destiny or meant to do something for people so we don't know so, but generally speaking i see i see something constructed so you- and so you have to decide what your pur- what you want your purpose to be and you get to decide that which is empowering like nobody else can tell you that or do that for you so you have to decide what's important i think i'll have to um reclassify that and say um this collective life like the life outside of ourselves as well okay yeah i was thinking very much of like individual life but at the same time though i mean it's not really a why like why is the wrong question we arose here under biological evolutionary conditions and have yeah but what if but because humans biological growth continues to like improve on information and complexity then like and it's yeah it's come to it's come to us it's come to us where does it go next yeah yeah and that's a big question is is there does this extend beyond like a human lifetime and nobody knows the answer to that i suspect very strongly that it does but i don't know you know if it's part of some bigger process of development that goes both before and after it or if this is all we've got but i think it could be the former and probably is the former. Um, and I say the nature of that is something akin to evolution, I guess, with like spiritual development or just a natural process of consciousness moving around. Yeah. But I don't know. Oh, okay. So it's just going, would you, would you put just map consciousness yeah, as like a, um, just like a continuous p- possibility network, kind of like a, just a, it, it just moves from like people in this position doing this stuff and then people in that position doing that stuff. Yeah. 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 Like it's, it's us moving and, mm-hmm. and the rest it of life. Could have, um, yeah. yeah. And it couldn't even have some kind of physical material aspect or, or cause too, that we just don't know about. Like, it's something equivalent to how you know we know about atoms now but the ancient greeks didn't like there's a lot of information we're missing so yeah because without I mean, science we don't have yet. without having an accurate answer to that question um it makes it hard to know 
um, like if there's something outside of just like pleasure and sports and art and music and creativity and uh, books and uh, you know, fiction and ideas. And, and that's the thing is, and there's, like is, you know, because all the things we think of as ourself, uh, I think, I don't know for sure, so, but I would think the things we know as ourself, like your emotion, your personality, the things that are housed in your brain like that, might not continue after death, just the consciousness. Virginia about like little kids it's always kids under six that like talk about a past life they remember and sometimes people will go find medical records or something and it's an actual person and it, it syncs up so I, and that would definitely imply like reincarnation so there is some evidence not super rigorous evidence but I feel there is evidence Mm. Mm. I think the rotation between dreams like going from one dream to the next and why we dream things in a particular order from day to day I think that has some physical manifestation in the world that will appear at some point It most certainly could, and I've known many people who have also had at one point a precognitive dream. It's yeah. really common. Yeah. What well, is a good question to ask someone you've never met? Um, I would say the one that I like is what would you say is like the most important to you in life and that can you know they can interpret that there's different a few different like ways or nuances uh, that someone could interpret the question that's too. just like the ultimate doorway to demand isn't it what's the most important thing to you yeah well i mean i know let's do the next one is how i would answer that question so to give some context i what i value most is wisdom and compassion which to me go together but i'm very knowledge seeking so like what's important to me is like finding new information and new knowledge and that's really my like driving yeah yeah i seek it in like small snapshots to know and like the so i like it when it's just like give me one word mm -hmm. and give it a definition and like you put put the meaning behind one word and then um I'll know what you're saying when you mean when you say it, and I won't have to look up any other information yeah. and stuff. If you want to answer, that knowledge would be the, the go-to there, and everybody, this is going to be different. Because mm. what people prefer and prioritize in knowledge and knowledge seeking determines the path that they go through it. that's true but mine is uh more wanting to understand the world broadly as a whole like why is it here why do things exist how do these things work and i just can't get enough of information about it and uh, i'm very uh, like widely read in the science of this soul yeah uh i don't know so uh, i i like um getting non-fiction textbooks so i've got a whole wish list of non-fiction textbooks that i want for like christmas and birthdays and stuff nice i'll have to hook you up with library and genesis because it might have a whole bunch yeah, of them for free I think it'll probably I, I, have, where you can buy it i've got library genesis and i think it'll have all of them but i still want the hard copies oh gotcha see i mostly do not do my reading on like my phone or tablet uh, so i just download from lit but i have like massive massive collections i like to of, like, just i like to highlight so them i like to highlight them put stickers in them and put sticky notes in them and write yeah. in them and then um underline things yeah i can dig it like you can't and yeah you can't quite them. recreate that like 
I identify with Snape in the Harry Potter. Noise. Um. <coughs> okay, I'm yeah. So, how would you answer that question of what is the most important thing to you? Well, I just, yeah, I did just like cover it. I had I kind of did is questions ten and eleven together because, like yeah. I said, I wanted to. Yeah. yeah, it would be if you wanted like a pithy one word answer, it would be knowledge, and I did explain well what knowledge seeking means to me which yeah it might not to someone else but so for me i'm doing it as um the best knowledge is knowledge of the future and so i'm getting predictive knowledge and doing that on like economic networks okay that's actually really fucking cool yeah uh, that's just, more and it's also a little more purpose driven because i feel me, like I if you're going to escape to capitalism you're gonna have to transcend it and the only way to do that is through like textbook knowledge oh absolutely and there's just like all of these like vast bodies of academic work about the topic but like nobody the, your average person has no idea about like how economic networks work or yeah. how these social structures are constructed yeah. and how they operate and how they arrive at social interaction because like a couple of little like ups and downs could um predict a huge change uh, but you wouldn't know unless you um saw what had happened before yeah, and that's typical of, like, complex systems, because really with that kind of thing, you're, you're looking at, like, systems theory and complex systems. Mm. They're dynamics. And every now and again, there would be something that would be added to the system that would make it change. And sometimes you contributing to the yeah. system can be that thing. And there's then what it yeah. creates an element of unpredictability. And you've got to c control for that when it gets introduced. Yeah. And it's really hard to control for anything like that when you're looking at a system such as an economic network because humans are complicated. The human brain is probably the most complex object in the known universe. So, you know, there's just so many, too many, so many variables and so many degrees of freedom that, I yeah, you, a wrench can be thrown in and throw the whole no one could have predicted it i reckon because Black most Swan of the event. most of the markets have to do with like um dollar to dollar investments so like us dollar to australian dollar for example um and um and then they're also like um how governments spend their money as well as um you have to get the the business capabilities of and the ownership and structure of and who's a member of what for each business so it's just like you it, you just have to map a whole bunch of data and then try and pump it into mm -hmm. one big network yeah yeah and it's it gets really hard to handle mathematically you know you can't just use a series of partial differential equations to fully capture this no but you could um he means obviously it has mathematical structure to it we were thinking of just starting with large language models and then mapping the um take you know how the there's networks in between the large language models we we're going to have extra yes. extra nodes from there that come out to the other oh, nodes okay. of um, the um, <clears throat> like the the LinkedIn profiles of the people of the, that work in the businesses. Yeah. Yeah, there's like all kinds of connections going on with that stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's what it's all about is connections and relationships between things and systems like I, I feel like systems theory we know that ibm a basis of a lot. we know that ibm already has all of that data but we have to map it from the outside yeah 
just with like open source intelligence. Humans are very good at math. Because that's where like yeah, knowledge comes down we'll... to like intelligence building. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of the AI stuff is proprietary, or the large language models is much more work for it. Like are, um, how quickly you can build your intelligence. So it's like. How quickly you can build your intelligence determines what, yeah. what capabilities your knowledge has. Yeah, and I don't think we're going to get like actual AI out of this particular technology, but it's like a step in that direction. Yeah. I, I work in marketing, specifically content marketing and SEO, so it's like a huge topic oh, cool. in my field. And people misrepresent or misunderstand like what a large language model actually is. Yeah, so because it's um, a network of like predictability. Um, yeah, I was gonna say it's basically it's, a linguistic prediction engine. It's a very impressive one. It's pretty much approximating to common sense. Exactly. It's like what would the most like what would this thing look like most likely? And in that sense, I feel yeah. like what it generates is a bit of a simulacrum. Yeah, it's just like a, a middle point. It's yeah. like a starting ground. Mm -hmm. I reckon if you can... Yeah, it's certainly not... An... If, you, if you alter it in a particular way where it's just like you in, you tell it to include um, particular words, um, you could see... Yeah. Um, like, I was thinking, because there's seven types of objectives, you could get it to always use all seven. Yeah. You know, when it gets like input, it's the, the machine learning aspect is pretty cool. Yeah. It it changes the way it does things you know, over time and has that built into its system. And if it needs to have like an um an and in one of the objectives to build a set because it doesn't have the right ones then it can just create a word for that. Yeah. So it just has a, a word name as an yeah. objective that's a set yeah. of the other objectives to fill it, just to yeah. fill everything out. Yeah. Because, you also, because it tries to predict things, or not like, tries, but if you're talking about because wood, it's like predictive, you get that. If you're talking about wood too. and you're asked of color, you might say brown, but then there could also be other colors of wood. So you might want to say brown and... Um, or you could just say yeah. any color. I, I don't know what you would call it in a wood color. So. Yeah. But you, you could create words that would represent that if it was complex enough. Yeah. Yeah, I could like come up with a neologism. I love neologism. Oh god, me too. I yeah, make them up sometimes too. It's like as long as it parses like morphologically, it's good to go. Yeah. Um What stories do you think convey the best morals apart from Jesus? What what are the teachings of those who displayed those best morals? Um, well, my sense of morality is very empathy based and basically revolves around minimizing suffering whenever you can for other beings. So very like kind of Buddhist, Dharmic religion leaning yep. approach there. Yeah, cool. And, you know, different people are also different, you know, for someone that doesn't have affective empathy, you know, they're NPD or something and their brain doesn't quite do it. You know, they might have more of a systemic approach to it, like system of ethics, thing. you know, focus on like justice and fairness rather than like empathy and suffering. But those are both valid ways to construct morality. So have you seen how how much they pay attention to ritual in the Buddhist um, monasteries? And yes. they, they treat everything as a ritual. Yeah, and it's they treat, very important with they, their... They even treat business as a ritual. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of power in that. Humans have rituals, and it's like an intrinsically human thing for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that. Um, I I think that's a a premise to uh, Judeo Christo. Um, like a, any kind of that as a shield. And but yeah, the teachings, actual teachings of Jesus, at least what's present like in the texts and attributed to him is pretty different from a lot of the like morality you see with like a lot of mainstream Christianity too. Yeah. Um, how do you define ego? Ego to me is the you that you think of as yourself. It's your sense of self as a person and like who you are, your personality, your traits, your thoughts, your emotions. Those are a part of the ego too. It's the part of the self that is what we would call self and selfhood. Do you think we should have a license to ego? A license to ego? Or a right to ego? <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone has to have an ego. It's oh, yeah. The word is sometimes in English colloquial has some kind of negative connotation, but it really doesn't. It's just uh, an important facet of mind and one of the biggest ones. It's our sense of being a person and a self and who would... Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's an aggregate of a bunch of different processes all going on on all these different levels that, that create that ego. Yeah. What's the difference between a healthy ego, a normal ego, and the problem with ordinary or normal ego? I prefer to, the I prefer not to use the word ordinary, uh, normal, and abnormal. Because abnormal pr means that it's like, um, I just think it's healthy and ordinary. Yeah. Because ordinary but, uh, means that regular you don't, person's ego. Because you can't make health, can't, yeah, you can't make health but, choices without health knowledge. Yeah, and it's the thing with that is that due to just general lack of insight, people are trapped in their ego and often cannot see outside of it. Yeah. and are sensitive to things that they perceive as wounds to the ego and the ego feels like something that's kind of like defend itself yeah and a healthy ego is something that you accept like the limitations of being a person that you can be wrong that you mess up and to accept that there's a lot in the world going on that isn't you and isn't your self-sense a healthy ego is also self-sustaining it's not it, the it's its health isn't contingent on external things like you know other people perceiving you as successful or whatever it's uh, its own thing and you hold it up by itself and you have to be at that point for self-actualization i think to right. be truly self-determined yeah like because there's a process to be made between um like getting out of just being an ordinary thing that dies young um yeah. and having health for an ego uh, yeah. the ego health is very important that's kind of what a lot of mental health is contingent on and because you've got to be able to like suffer a little bit without dying inside uh, yeah it's you know you have to be able to stand on your own and not have your ego and sense of ego ego strength be dependent on anything or anyone else yeah so if it's not dependent on anyone else the rights to ego has to be individualized yeah it's it's yours that you take and claim for yourself like what is more your own than yeah. yourself yeah.
Who are your three favourite people from history and why are they your favourites? What did they do that makes them famous to you in your eyes? Wow, that's going to be one of those where I'm like blanking out and trying to pick something. Yeah. As far as historical figures, um, I really like Francois Villon. He's a French poet from the Middle Ages who just like lived this crazy life. He was this like vagabond rogue, rogue bard. And, you know, he like lived on the streets and like was a criminal and he uses like thieves argot in his, in his, um, the tree. And I just find him such a fascinating figure. And then let's see who else other than Bion. Um, let's see who else should I pick? Um, I would say maybe. Gosh, I really don't know. I don't know why I'm like having a time with this. Um, Carl Jung. Carl Jung. Oh, yeah. Um, because he pioneered psychology so deeply, I would definitely choose Carl Jung um, as among that list. Yeah, I reckon people that have a huge focus on the unconscious it go to Carl Jung. Yeah, yeah, and it's something that tends to work for, for us as far as personal healing or depth psychology approaches. Like, that was important for me when I was younger and I was struggling with mental health issues. Yeah. Um, and one more. I had to plug my laptop back in. Oh, uh, but yeah, next I'll pick a, I gotta pick a third. Um, let's see. Oh. You know? Um. Yeah, sorry, I'm all like, um, uh. Uh, you know, let's see, maybe, uh, who else is there that was interesting? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know why I'm like struggling so much with it. I'm like, ah. But, um, picking another historical figure. Um, it's not a specific historical figure, like a person, it's more of a historical type of person uh, but Greek heteri just the whole vibe and concept is like really influential on me as a person and the kind of person I am you know so they were like the highest class of prostitute and they were trained in like philosophical discourse and went to symposia so they were basically like hookers you could have a philosophical conversation with oh wicked <laughs> yeah and they yeah yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, I, I relate to that. Yeah, that's cool. It was also a way for women to have access to that kind of thing because, like, they were the only women who were, like, literate. Yeah. So, um, I haven't told you anything about me. So, um, we'll have to, um, okay. do another interview yeah. where we're talking more like casually i guess as opposed to just running off oh. preset yeah questions. we can definitely because uh, i've had those questions for everyone yeah and i could come up with like uh, and yeah yeah and i could come up with a couple questions to ask you and they're all kind of like book answers they're not really like about you oh yeah yeah and you know i went into like the underworld stuff which is sort of starting to talk about like me you know versus yeah. like the texts that in, and the actors that influenced me yeah but yeah what do you think of the questions uh, i think they're very interesting and i can definitely see what you're doing here just like asking these kinds of questions to just like various people yeah. And getting answers because they're the questions that make people really think about things. Because everyone that I've no. come into contact and with has some kind of like a grasp on most of that. Uh, 
it tells you a lot about them. And answering those kind of questions can also um, inform people more about themselves because they have to stop and think of an answer. And, you know, maybe it's something about themselves they didn't think about before. Yeah. I'm going to have to raid the Greta K. Solomon. That sounds so good. Yeah, Dream in the Underworld. Like, if you're into occult stuff, I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. So, yeah, <clears throat> would you classify those books as, like, hard knowledge, or would you put knowledge in into a different category? Um, I would say they contain knowledge, but also, like, context and perspective, because they're very analytical works. But, yes, I, I read so much. And I also read a lot of, like, hard science stuff, textbooks, too. Like, I'm into really into evolutionary biology and really into theoretical cosmology. Sorry about those, too. Yeah. But with the kind of uh, texts I was mentioning in the interview, it's... Um, a big part of my knowledge seeking is seeking those understandings maybe more wisdom than knowledge but be like understandings of, of things and like yeah. how they work and do you have doing. do you have writings of your own you would i'm not i actually i haven't for so long but i probably should i actually wrote professionally for years yeah. uh, i was a i was just a copywriter but uh, most of my writing lately has been like work career related and so I hadn't really pursued that I guess well, what I was, about like, what about if you're focusing on one thing it. which was like knowledge building and trying to like build a structure around um, not not building any particular type of knowledge but unless you wanted to um, uh, yeah. unless you had a process in place that like as you're building out the knowledge you thought um, you might want to um, build it faster or um, build more yeah. connections into it as you're writing it? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you mentioned connections and that's the big thing for me is, you know, I'm neurodivergent. I have ADHD and sometimes we're like that, but I make connections between things, often yeah. disparate things that other people might see. Yeah. Like in my work in marketing, I bring in a lot of insights from like sociology and insights from like you know recent developments in psychology, and um, you know I can I just make connections and bring things in. Like I was reiterating Irving Goffman the other day because it applies to like personal branding. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I often like stitch my times together. Like if something's happening throughout the day, I'll be like. Oh, I was thinking about this earlier, so I'll just plug this again. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, I get different hyper fixations, and they kind of circle. Like, um, sometimes I'm in, like, a cherry biology phase, and then, and then I'll be in, like, a postmodern critical theory phase. I kind of phase in with what I read, but it's usually mostly the same general topic areas. They just kind of cycle around. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, are you like waiting for something like amazing and new to have been discovered through artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence, honestly, no, because you know I've read the the papers and looked at the map and stuff and i also i've spoken to quite a few like engineers that work on it about it yeah it's not it's a really impressive um it's a really really impressive piece of machine learning software it really is but yeah. this isn't this doesn't have anything to do with like what we think of as even soft ai you know, yeah, so i was thinking that's just not really part of what it is if they wanted to do something properly they would have to look at signatures as well. Yeah. So they're not looking at signatures yet, but they would have to like, um, a signature would be like, every, if you get a particular word and you place it in every position of the text and then you read out how that changes the network and um, yeah. you follow the signal around and then you amplify it and talk about like um, what the... Um, 
what it would mean to say that wholeheartedly. Yeah, and I also, like, it could be possible that if you're, if you're talking about, like, actual artificial intelligence, like, could and would humans build something that actually is conscious and intelligent? Yeah. Um, I think there is maybe a small chance that it wouldn't be possible with binary silicon computing, but could be possible with quantum computing. And uh, yeah. that's where I was on Robert Penrose's ideas with, like, um, orchestrated reduction which involves a bose einstein condensate like structure you reckon they can clear out the noise and you know i had re fruitful research that has come to it come from it to some extent so maybe he's right but if consciousness is like a quantum component you know quantum computing would probably be needed to get the level of complexity and the type of structure necessary do you reckon they can clear out and yeah. llm is just you reckon they can clear out the noise <laughs> Oh, come again? Do you reckon they can clear out the noise and make it small enough? Yeah, I don't know, honestly. Yeah, you're right that it would also, like, the device itself would have to be, like, a small size. And, like, like I said, I think, I, I, like, actual AI, or at least soft AI, probably will be a thing. But we're not quite there yet. But the yeah. types of structures we're working on and working with language models probably are a step toward something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I might pause yeah. the recording there. Oh, that's fine. I yeah. figure we've like been through questions and everything. Thanks for um doing that so early on in our relationship. Oh no problem. This, yeah, this was a really interesting exercise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. like thank you. That was that was neat. Yeah. yeah.